sharing with us. And, uh, um, and Ben is just a model for all of us because, you know, the deal is we want to aspire to be like Jesus. But you can start with being like Ben, and that'll get you there. You'll be on the right track. Um, and really what Ben shares with us is just being available to letting God do stuff and work through his life. That's just all. It wasn't about his ability at all. It's just about making the choice to be available to God. And, and then God starts doing what God does, and that's transform lives and, and bring us into relationship. And that's really what this has always been about for God. It's about us being in relationship with him and his desire to be sharing that relationship, his love with everyone he's created. Um, and we get to be a part of that. And Ben just models for us that you can do it. He really can. And so uh, um, it's an exciting thing when we think about just what a relationship is supposed to look like when it's a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, speaking of relationships, um, I have, in my household, there is great concern about a relationship that is developing. It's developing in all the right ways, don't get me wrong. We just have to, you know, pay a lot of attention to it. And we paid an extreme amount of attention to it last night. We had an engagement party at the Miller household um, celebrating, yeah, <laughs> celebrating Elisha and Isa. And, uh, um, and here's the thing. They had a motto for last night. We even have a picture of it. Um, love is in bloom. You know, it's kind of fun. You know, a relationship starts, love is in bloom, and it's about a beautiful thing exploding forth. Um, but there was a second kind of narrative that we were working with, and that was, um, it was a little bit more subtle, but the kind of emphasizing that the wedding is just the beginning. Because that's how relationships work. Relationships aren't about a singular event. They're about a progression. And a way of kind of thinking about that progression, Brian touched on it a minute ago, is just how you start your day. The day is kind of a metaphor for how relationships kind of develop. There's, the, there's that pre-dawn light that happens. That's exciting and it's enthusiastic. There's all sorts of stuff going on. Then there is the event, and that is when the sun actually dawns. It breaks over the horizon, and boom, there is light. And that's an exciting moment. And if anybody has woken up early enough to see that, you have to get a little early now to see it. But as you do, there's just kind of this, I'm excited about the day kind of thing. And, and you kind of have, I don't know about you all, but if you're awake for it, there's these kind of early morning productive hours. You might call that from a relational perspective, the honeymoon phase, right? Where, where there's a whole lot of fun stuff happening. And, uh, but then here's the deal. We live in Arizona, so around about 10.30, here it comes. The wilting heat of midday starts to shine. Anybody that's been in a relationship for more than a couple of years knows exactly what I'm talking about. It's coming. It gets hot. Um, and we start muscling our way through that, sometimes by our own resources. That's a bad idea. Other times we realize that we need support. We need help. And, and God provides that. And then there's this thing that happens to me, at least, in the afternoon where all of a sudden there's kind of this renewed sense of purpose a renewed purpose in the afternoon to get things done because there's things that need to get done before the sun sets. Um, and then as that afternoon fades into a later afternoon, the shadows start to grow longer. I call that the joy of the coming cool. Um, and I know that y'all have had that experience too, right? Where you've been working in the yard and then the sun is starting to go down and it's actually getting cooler outside. You're spent because you've been working all day, but, but you can, I can get a little bit more done. And you get excited about that. And then finally, of course, to follow the metaphor all the way through, there is that, that peace that comes with the sun setting and knowing that it's all going to happen again. Now, that's a metaphor for a relationship, a metaphor for marriage. Um, but, but the biblical narrative um, circles around this marriage metaphor because it is how God sees his relationship with all of humanity. God wants to enter into that kind of a relationship with us. The ultimate desire of God is to be in a loving relationship with each of his children. That is the ultimate desire of God. And the only way to be in relationship is to actually be with the one you love, right? 
It doesn't work to have an idea of the one you love. You have to actually be in communication with them. You have to be in union with them. You have to be together. And that's what this whole season has really been about, as we've been talking about walking in the presence of God and um, in that relationship and how it grows. So to recap, all the way back to the beginning of the year, um, we, we started off with practicing the presence of God and how when we do that, it changes everything. And we were excited about that, and then we moved into Lent where we had to talk about the stuff that we don't want to talk about, all of the obstacles that get in the way of us practicing the presence of God, of us being in God's presence. And, and we could summarize that really quick and easily by saying, there's the world, there's the flesh, and yeah, there's the devil. There's something out there that is doing everything it can to prevent us from being in that kind of a relationship with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But we find our way into what we're doing now in this series. If we are intentional, and that's the deal, we must make an intentional choice to be with Jesus. We have to be intentional about it, which means that we have to turn our back on the world, the flesh, and the devil, and, and say, I am choosing to do this. And that's what Ben was describing to us when he just said, you know, I'm going to choose to make these habits a part of my life. I'm going to choose to live into these patterns. And great things start happening because when we spend time with God, we start to have God rub off on us, right? Um, to be like Jesus is to love like Jesus. We've said that a few times now, and it's just important. The more time we spend with Jesus, the more time we start seeing ourselves starting to think and act like him, starting to see the world through his eyes. It's not about our ability to do anything. It's just all about being available. Just hang out with God, and God's going to change you. But there's the deal, and Brian touched on this too. We have to give up control, don't we? We have to let go and trust God. Because we have our own designs, right? All of us have our own sense of, this is how I'd like to turn out at the end. Um, but that's a bad plan. God has the right plan for each and every one of us. And so here's the thing, though. It's going to bring us up to today. Um, we're in this progression, right? Be with God. That's great. Spend time with him, being with Jesus, you start to become like Jesus. You start to adopt his character traits. You start to love on others. And then we find ourselves stepping into this, doing as Jesus does. Yes, we absolutely are called to bask in the Father's love. We want to soak up his presence. But the deal is, we have a role and a purpose to serve in his plan. We have marching orders that we get to step into. And, and I'm excited about this because when we think about what God's master plan has always been about, it has always included each and every one of us. I am going to start today in Mark chapter 1, verse 1, and um, I actually don't like the the NLT version of this because he changes it around or the, uh, the, the team changes it around a little bit. So I'm going to go with the NIV. And the NIV says, the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. The beginning of the good news. That's how this book of the Bible starts <clears throat> because he's making clear that this story is not over. And if you get all the way to the end, um, Mark's, uh, Mark was written probably in the year 45 AD, so about 10 to 15 years after the resurrection. Um, and, and the oldest manuscripts actually end abruptly in chapter 16, the first part of verse 8. Um, it just stops where the women are walking away from the, the tomb, wondering whether or not they're going to tell anybody what's just happened. The oldest manuscripts just stop right there. There are other manuscripts that are, that are around that we have in our Bibles um, that have either a short ending or a longer ending. And I like one of the short ending just gives a couple more sentences, and it says this. Um, this is in Mark 16, 8c, we'll call it. Afterwards, Jesus himself sent them out from east to west, with the sacred and unfailing message of salvation that gives eternal life. Amen. That's how that gospel ends, because Mark is trying to emphasize that the story is still happening. We 
are that story. Luke does it similarly. He, uh, in, in the, the Gospel of Luke, he starts off, uh, the first line is he says to, hey, Theophilus, that's a, that's a friend of his. We don't know anything about Theophilus. Um, he says, hey, I've put together an orderly account so that you can know what's going on. I interviewed witnesses. Here's what's happening. And he writes the Gospel of Luke. And then he wrote his next book um, was the book of Acts. And this is how Luke starts that book, um, Acts chapter 1. In my first book, I told you, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do and teach. And now, as he's writing this next book, the book of Acts, it is about how the story keeps going because the mission is still there. You see, the resurrection is the dawn of our newly restored relationship with God through Jesus Christ. On Resurrection Sunday, he, the sun rose from the eastern horizon. That's why we call it Easter, right? Uh, the sun rises in the east, and the disciples, they entered into a new phase of their relationship and apprenticeship with Jesus Christ. They each got to go out on a journey of sharing his love, and we are all invited into the same thing. When we accept Jesus into our lives, there's that dawn of that a moment where we say, I'm in on this. And, and all of a sudden, there's an enthusiasm that goes with that. Isn't this starting to sound familiar, right? The day, dawn breaking. And then um, we get moving along. And then, you know, we do have to deal with the, uh, the wilting heat of midday. But, but the way this has all worked is that being with Jesus is that initial dawn for us. And like the disciples, the more we spend time with him, the more we become like Jesus. And so the more we find ourselves seeing the world in the same way that Jesus sees the world. And the more we spend time with Jesus, the more we begin to love the people around us. Even the most fallen and broken people, we will find ourselves loving. But that's when this fundamental change of perspective gets tested by that wilting midday sun. Can we really love everyone? I mean, really? Can I, can I bring myself to love the poor, the lost, and the, the marginalized? Well, you know what? I could probably pull that off. I like to think of myself as a generous guy. But what about the broken? They're kind of annoying. Can I really love them? What about the, what about the violent? I mean, there's no room for that. Can I really love those who are violent? Can I love my enemy? Can each of us do that? And the simple fact of the matter is, we cannot, but Christ in us can. And that's what this journey is all about. Once we surrender ourselves to Jesus and actually let him dwell in our hearts, that's when we will be able to hear and respond to God's call in our lives the call to step into that mission. And uh, the call of Jesus for those who have surrendered their lives to him is to do as he does, which brings us now to kind of the theme chapter or theme verse that we're gonna be digging into today. This is John chapter 14, um, beginning at verse 12. John's gospel, um, he, he kind of sets the stage by, um, <coughs> excuse me, he sets, the, this is kind of his last supper scene. Um, he's just done some amazing things, and this is how he says at verse 12, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I am going to be with the Father. You can ask for anything in my name, and I will do it so that the Son can, be, uh, can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. All right. This is a powerful, powerful line if we think about it. But first we need to, we need to add a clarification. The name of Jesus is not a magic word. You cannot walk into the Jaguar dealership, invoke his name, and drive away in a free car. <laughs> Trust me, I, I tried. <laughs> So, so what we're saying is that, and what Jesus is saying is that when we become true, genuine believers, when we've let his character indwell in us, then, then we're not going to be asking for things that Jesus wouldn't be asking for. 
where our character, we hope, is being shaped by him. So we're being guided and we're interested in things that he's interested in. We're not interested in the things that, that previously occupied our attention. So, so we would be asking on Jesus' behalf. But let's get back to the bombshell here. The bombshell is that Jesus says this, you will do the same works I have done and even greater Think about that. Jesus, who made the lame walk, who restored sight to the blind, who fed the masses, and even raised the dead. We are called, each and every one of us here, in relationship with Jesus Christ, to be on par with that. Wow. So what does this mean for us? All right. I'm not saying that anybody should just get up from here and run off to the ER and start laying hands on people, though that's not a terrible idea, I'll have you know. Um, we, could, we could be praying for each other a whole lot more, but, but Jesus is actually calling us in to assume his role in the world as God's active presence to those who do not yet have a direct and personal relationship with him. Think about that for just a minute. If you're growing in your relationship with God, if you're, if you're striving to live in his presence um, and we're going through that progression, for those who don't know Jesus exists for them at all, how does Jesus show up? Well, he models that for us. He shows up in people's lives. And guess what? We get to serve that role in the lives of those who don't yet have a relationship with God. So how are we going to do that? Well, we can follow Jesus himself as the pattern. There's a pattern that we can observe in Jesus as he performed the task of bringing the good news to people. And it really comes down to three basic steps, three rhythms that we see in Jesus. First, he made space for the gospel. Then he preached the gospel. And then he demonstrated the gospel. We see this pattern in him throughout the, the, the text. And then we see the disciples, um, the apostles, living into this model um, throughout the rest. So, so we're going to break down each one of these and talk about how that figures into our lives potentially. And we're going to start off with making space for the gospel. All right, and that's hospitality. It's a great word, hospitality. It turns out um, the word breaks down in Greek to love of, uh, love, yeah, love of stranger. Loving on strangers. That's what hospitality is all about. And Jesus models that for us right off the bat. This is John chapter 1. Um, the, uh, the scene is that, well, I'll just read it. Here it is. The following day, John, this is John the Baptist, was again standing with two of his disciples. As Jesus walked by, John looked at him and declared, look, there is the, the Lamb of God. When John's two disciples heard this, they followed Jesus. Jesus looked around and saw them following. What do you want? He asked them. They replied, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come and see, he said. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon when they went with him to the place where he was staying and they remained there with him for the rest of the day. So Jesus, you can imagine the scene. Jesus is walking along and there's two stalkers behind him wondering what his life is all about. And he turns around and he sees him. He's like, what do you guys want? Oh, well, we just want to, I don't know, where, where are you staying? He goes, you know what? Come on over. Let's have dinner together. It's 4 o'clock in the afternoon. It's going to be about time to eat soon. So he invites them in. Now, there is no, in, in the text, there is no incredible revelation about what happened next. Um, it, just, it just goes on to say that, that, that Andrew was one of them, and he starts telling everybody, we, we found the guy. But we don't know that there was any dramatic teaching or anything like that. It was just Jesus spending time being genuine with these two guys. And here's the great thing about it. You can invite people to dinner too. I mean, if you eat, you can do this. It really is that easy. You don't have to have an agenda. You don't have to have any kind of special education. You just need to welcome people into your home and make it a safe place, a place where you just share your life. Because here's the thing. If, if you are walking in the presence of God and you are beginning to find your character shaped by God, you're not going to be able to help yourself. You're going to find yourself talking about God because it's a part of who you are. It's really that simple. 
years ago, um, we went to a church in Goodyear, and uh, um, the church's history was that they were, there was a stretch there where they were on the brink of, of collapse. Um, the uh, treasurer apparently had announced that um, with current giving levels, the church will not last 90 days. It was done for, they, at least the treasurer thought. Now, a couple of things happened. A new pastor rolled in, but I think more important than that, the Capellis rolled in. Chris and Jim Capelli uh, had just retired, and they'd moved down to, uh, to Pebble Creek, and they picked that church to be the church they were going to go to. And uh, they walked in, and there weren't that many people there, but the Capellis did what the Capellis did. And they said, hey, every Tuesday we have dinner at our house, and they invited anybody they talked to to come join them for dinner. That's it. They invited people to dinner at their house on Tuesdays. Now, I went to one of these dinners. This was now years later. The congregation had, uh, was, was vastly different. Um, but, and apparently the routine was pretty simple, and they never changed the formula. They had people show up at about 6 o'clock on Tuesday evening. They, uh, they, they had some, some chips and salsa sitting out. Um, they hung out, and, uh, um, but most people seemed to have arrived. Chris would make Jim quiet everybody down, and they would just bless the food because they're a Christian household. That's what you do. You bless the food. And then they just went on to eating and drinking and chatting and hanging out. That's all they did until the very, very end. Then Chris would say, hey, I just want to check in with everybody. Can we do highs and lows? That's what they did. They went around so everybody had a chance to share. And over the course of years, they went from just a handful of people from the church so the time I went, they'd been doing it for about 10 years at that point. The house was packed, and this was happening every Tuesday night. And that's all there was to it. And this was one of the, one of the places that people would interact with the Capellis and then say, where do you go to church? And they'd end up joining the church. It's just that simple. Hospitality. There's a, uh, we've mentioned this woman before, Rosaria Butterfield. She was a, a, a liberal arts professor, an atheist, an aggressive LGBTQ policy advocate. And she admits that her life was turned entirely upside down because she started having dinner once a week with a Christian. Over the course of a year, her life was completely transformed. And, and this is what she writes. It, uh, the book she writes is actually titled, um, The Gospel Comes with a House Key. And this is from the introduction of that book. She says, radically ordinary hospitality. Those who live, uh, those who live it see strangers as neighbors and neighbors as family of God. They recoil at reducing a person into a category or label. They see God's image reflected in the eyes of every human being on earth. Those who live out radically ordinary hospitality see their homes not as theirs at all, but as God's gift to use for the furtherance of his kingdom. They open doors. They seek out the underprivileged. They know that the gospel comes with a house key. Wow. All you got to do is invite people in, put some food in front of them, and just start talking. God will take it over from there. It's amazing. Okay, so we'll move from hospitality to, uh, to preaching the gospel. Oh, gosh, this is Jesus preaching the gospel. That's terrifying. Am I supposed to actually do that? Well, here's what Jesus says in Acts chapter, chapter 1, verse 8. Um, he's speaking to the disciples who are now about to take on their new marching orders. He says, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You will be my witnesses. Now, a witness is somebody who merely testifies to the experience that they have had. That's it. Our job as followers of Jesus Christ is to be witnesses, not converters, not salesmen, witnesses. We just share what happens in our life with those who are willing to listen. It's up to them what they want to do with that information, just like it's up to the judge to make a decision after he's heard all the witnesses speak. That's the way it works. We don't have to change anybody. We just tell the story of how God came to be a part of our lives. I'm thinking about it just now. If you, if you leaf through the book of Acts, um, we all know the story of the Apostle Paul. 
um, and how he ends up having a, an interaction with Jesus on the road to Damascus. Uh, and then he goes on to tell that story like four different times through the book of Acts. Every time he finds himself cornered by people, he says, all right, let me just tell you what happened to me. That's what he does. He tells his story. He witnesses to how God changed his life. And then it's up to you. He leaves it in the hands of whoever just heard his testimony. The second thing that I see happening in this whole um, preaching the gospel and Jesus does is Jesus prays not just for people, he prays on people. When I say for people, sometimes you know it's easy to say to somebody, gosh, you're having a really rough situation. I promise that I'm going to pray for you. Now what that says is like I'm going to go home tonight and during my regular routine, I'm going to try to squeeze you in somehow, right? But to pray on somebody, that's different. To pray on somebody is to, is to pray for them right there on the spot. And this doesn't have to be anything incredibly radical. It could be, though. Somebody who's having a really difficult time and saying, you know what, can, can I pray for you right now? It's meaningful when you do it. It's terrifying the first few times because they might say no. But if you want to ease your way into this, a friend of mine by the name of Libby um, had a habit. Um, Libby was going to school um, at the same seminary I was, and, uh, and when we would all show up for, uh, for classes on campus, the first thing we'd do is we'd, we'd head off and have dinner together, all of us students. And, uh, and so we're gathered around a big table, and Libby had her routine, and nobody was going to interrupt it, and we all needed to learn from it anyway. Um, Libby made it a point to always get the waiter or waitress's name. And they always introduce themselves, right? Um, Hi, my name is Alice. I'll be taking your order today. Um, and so she would write that down in her brain. Okay, our waitress today is Alice. And then, inevitably, the meal would come out. And when the meal comes out, you know how this works. The, it's usually brought up by a team, especially when there's a large group. But then your waiter or waitress will come and say, okay, did everybody get what they wanted? And Libby would have insisted that none of us had yet touched our food. Because uh, Libby would say, no, I think everything's fine. But listen, we're about to bless this food. Is there anything we can pray for for you? That would be it. Now, oftentimes, the, the waiter or waitress was taken aback. Uh, no, I, I, I'm fine. Okay, well, we'll just pray for you anyway. <laughs> Sometimes they would say, well, no, I, I don't mind. Do you have anything specific? Usually they didn't. Occasionally, well, I am going through a difficult time. She'd say, stop right there. You don't need to tell me. God knows it. Let's pray. And we'd pray. Bless the food. Name the waiter or waitress. Pray on them in that moment. It was pretty awesome. And it's easy to do. Because it's a habit that hopefully we're all forming as we bless our food anyway. Don't be afraid of doing it. The next thing that we see in Jesus' life is that he just lives a beautiful life. The Apostle Peter actually grabs this in his first letter. Um, this is 1 Peter chapter 2. He says, Live such good lives among the um, yeah, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong. They may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Now, first off, the word pagan um, has different baggage with it for us. There, it was just anybody who was not uh, a Jew or a Christian. Um, it's just everybody else. So the Romans, the Greeks, the Gentiles um, is, is what he's saying there. And just the idea is that if we're living good lives, people are going to look at us. And even if they're causing us trouble and don't agree with our beliefs, it's okay. They, they, they will still see us and begin to recognize that we're living our lives different. We're living our lives with a sense of joy, something more than happiness, right? Um, and, and this is an incredibly powerful witness. According to scholars... The rapid growth of the early church was primarily about regular Christians sharing their lives with others. It was not about the apostles. Um, it was not about the professional pastors. Um, it was not about, as, a, as a one scholar, Michael Green is his name, he called them celebrity Christians. No, it was just normal believers living their unusual lives. Unusual because as followers of Jesus, they were living life very differently. And what does that look like? Well, we know that one too because this has popped up a few times. John 
chapter 13, beginning at verse 34. A new command I give you. Not really very new, actually. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. When you love people on that list that I gave earlier, it gets noticed. When you find yourself loving your enemy, somebody standing there will look at you and say, how could you possibly love that person? I, uh, I should have looked this up before bringing it up, but I'm gonna just bring it up anyway. Um, I, I heard the story of a woman whose son was, was killed in, a, in some gang violence. The, uh, the man, young man that killed her son was caught and jailed. Um, she went through a, ser- a, a, a period of extreme grief and mourning and was very, very angry, but in that, she found Christ And as her journey of Christ progressed, she found herself realizing that she needed to forgive the man who took her son's life. And so uh, she prayed about that, and then she actually reached out to her attorney and said, I would really like to actually meet the man directly so that I can tell him that I forgive him. The uh, lawyers all advised against it, and they said, but if you want to meet them, um, they have to agree to it. So she wrote him a letter. And... uh, Um, He didn't respond right away. It was a few months later that he actually wrote back and said that he would be willing to meet her. He went and they met and she prayed with him and she forgave him. And then when he got out of prison, he was heading back to to his family and the circumstances that were there and she'd actually developed enough of a relationship with him that go figure, she said, why don't you move in with me? Can you imagine that? The man that took your son's life, and you say, you know what? I want to help you out, and I've forgiven you that much. Come live with me. That is what we call demonstrating the gospel, really. Demonstrating the gospel is to to love people around you no matter who or what they are. Can you believe even loving somebody from that other party that's not your party. That's probably the hardest one there. I'd have taken the murderer. (laughs) We got to love people, and that is what demonstrating the gospel looks like, is to love everyone no matter what. And that's what Jesus does. He demonstrates that in his life. He loves everybody. So what were the three rhythms again? He made space for the gospel, he preached the gospel, he demonstrated the gospel, and we can do that too. The call of Jesus for those who have surrendered their lives to him is to do as he does. To love others is to prove, I'm sorry, (laughs) that is to prove that you love them by your actions, right? And that's what God does, and that's the call for us, is to love on others. Um, There is no way that we can live this kind of radical calling of Jesus Christ without Jesus in us. We are broken. There's just no doubt about it. But he comes to us first, because that's how it works. Jesus enters into our lives and transforms us. We are the ones that are broken, but he comes to us and invites us to see the world his way. It is only his way, his truth, and his life that can free us from the pattern of sin that has prevented us from living the way that he's called us to live. And you know what's fun is where when we recognize that it's Jesus that came to us, we also probably all recognize that it's Jesus that came to us by way of this person or that person or that witness because they were living into this call of stepping into the role of Christ. We said a few weeks ago that the uh, the term Christian, um, which is not used hardly at all in the Bible, um, re- meant little Christs. Well, this is where that term is not a bad term. We get to be little Christs to people so that we can introduce them to the real Christ. And that's amazing. The sacrifice of Jesus on the cross assures us of our freedom 
and a freedom that, that we could never have deserved, a love that God had for us that, that we could not have, have expected and certainly couldn't do anything to make happen. But when we recognize that, that Jesus is more than just on the cross giving us a path to salvation, that he's a prototype for how we're supposed to live our lives, we get to go on and not just have a change in perspective, we get to have completely and utterly changed lives. This is the transformation that none of us seeks, but all of us desire. And our friend John Kluver said it last week when he said, once you've experienced the presence of God, really felt him there, you will crave it. The more we know God's love in our lives, the more we will want to shout it to the world so that everybody can know that Jesus is the God of love. It is his love that will get us through that wilting midday and on to the renewed purpose of being servants of Christ. All we need to do is surrender our lives to him, to walk every moment of every day aware of his presence, and to allow his character to shape our lives so that we can live lives the same way that Jesus lived his and continues to live it through us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your love. We thank you for the for your passion. We thank you for your sacrifice, and we thank you that we, we get to be your servants to represent your love in this world. Thank you, Lord, that, that we can learn what it means to live in your presence every day, that we can be transformed by that, that our character can change to the one, the character that you've always desired for us to have, a character of love. And we thank you again, Lord that we can learn what it means to do as you do and be your ambassadors in this world. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.